see the wall would come up, but it tried like this and do something so simply and so effectively and so beautifully. And we were like, why didn't I think of that? Why does he know that? And an example came to mind. I was in a play called Yellow Jack. Huge hit. I'm sure you all heard of it. <laughs> and um, I was playing a scientist in Africa. Right back when I was with my friend Jeff Woodman, we were scientists. We were in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa. We're in the studio rehearsing it, and Walt wanted to help us with an improv. So we had a rolling chair with his donut. Remember the Walt donut? <laughs> on the chair. And Walt decided to play the various animals in the jungles of Africa. <laughs> so they were definitely walking. There's Walt on the chair going, like, ah, ah, ah. And we were laughing and laughing, but then, in time, that was a tiger in the jungle of Africa. And I'm sure if we asked Walt, he would have told us what the tiger had for breakfast, where his parents were from, who his friends were, and what day of the week it was that he was going to eat a scientist. <laughs> his acting, when it came in flashes, you just thought, I'll never be able to do that. But he showed us that we can do it. Um, never as good as he, but we can do it. Uh, next up we have Lenore, is it Dakota? No. no. She has some time. Lenore, would you come up again, please? Stephanie. Lenore? Stephanie? Or Firstman. Firstman. Yeah. Uh, Lenore was a student, is a student of Walt's. Uh, wonderful singer. Are you going to sing for us this evening? I'm going to speak and sing. Alright, Lenore will come up to speak and sing. teaching also in the studio, and the two of us would be on the board, Lenore Jacobin and Lenore Firstman. And uh, when, when I walked in the room, I saw these cutouts, and I thought from back there that there was like a rehearsal going on, and people were getting, you know, they were getting their pictures taken. And then as I got closer, I was like, oh, it's Walt, they're all Walt, you know, in all of these period costumes. Walt did love to dress up. And um, I tell you, when he played this part, that was a girl. <laughs> Even with the beard. That was a girl. It was amazing. Um, so I've been asked to read um, Lena Gabrielli's words of uh, remembrance for Walt. She uh, unfortunately had broken her pelvis and is not able to be here. She's, she's actually going to celebrate her 90th birthday very shortly. Um, so I'm happy to read what she said. From the moment I met him over 50 years ago, Walt was not only my dear friend, but also my teacher and mentor. I started studying in Walt's acting class in the early 60s, and believe me, it was a revelation. His criticisms were so brilliantly on point, so original. He had a way of nudging you in the right direction so that we discovered his technique without force. It was truly exciting. Walt had a way of getting us to not really develop a character, but rather to reveal a character. As many of you know, Walt's acting class eventually morphed into the Masterworks Laboratory Theater, and we developed many productions, often in workshop first. The production of La Traviata, which Walt produced and brilliantly directed for the Actors Studio, was probably the most artistically satisfying work of my career. Working with Walt, learning how to live on stage, greatly enriched my artistic life. And having him as a lifelong friend greatly enriched my life. So I thank you, Walt, for sharing your art and your life with us. I was truly blessed to have known you. I miss you, my dear, dear friend. And also, Barbara Berry, who uh, is a lifelong friend of Walt's, a wonderful actress, who, uh, from my recollection, I think she coached with Walt almost every part that she ever played. Uh, she was always at his, I used to see, him, see her at his studio when I would come in to, for a class <coughs> or coaching. And Barbara sent these words. Walt would say, while you were investigating a scene, remember where you just came from? and remember where you were going when the scene is over. It is one of the most revelatory things I ever learned, 
and his energy. Remember his fast-talking energy? That was the way he lived his life. Walt knew everything about acting and directing. He could break down a character and find its life and make you wonder why you couldn't have done that for yourself. He could show you the way to bring a character to life. He did all this with grace, friendship, laughter, and absolute concentration. If he had not been my friend, my coach, and my teacher all throughout my acting life, I probably would not be performing a play this afternoon, which makes it impossible for me to be here with you all. So Walt, darling, it is all your fault that I'm occupied today, but I send you love and thanks and gratitude for the gifts you gave me and which you gave to all your students. There will never be another like you from Barbara Berry. I just have to get a tissue. I'm already for the top. I'd already been working a couple of years professionally, let's say. You know, dinner theater counts. I mean, you got like $80 a week. <laughs> and uh, so I look at the brochure and read the descriptions of the classes and pick a couple of people, while being one of them, whose descriptions kind of made sense to me. So I, I audited his class, and I knew right away, he's the one. That's my mentor, because he was a genius. <laughs> And everything he said made sense. It, was, it made so much sense. It was like reading a great novel. You wished you had thought, thought of it first, but, but he thought of it all the time. So, thus began my life in New York and my long discovery and evolutionary process that studying with Walt was. With Walt, there were no quick fixes if you signed up, you were in for the long haul. <laughs> I once asked him for career advice, thinking that he might bestow some pearl of wisdom on me. Is that smart? And he simply said, where was Andrew? Stick around. <laughs> where is he? Stick around. So I stuck around, because my teacher told me to. I studied with Walt in one of his many classes, on and off, for about 20 years, and then after that, the occasional coaching, depending on what came up for me. He actually even hired me to coach him once in later years, which really was a trip <laughs> and an honor. Um, at one time or another, I studied acting technique, scene study, Shakespeare, and poetry, directing, musical theater, each class different and equally valuable. I had the good fortune to work under his direction in three Masterworks Factory Theater shows, Gondoliers, Lessons in Love, and The Misanthrope, with many of you beautiful people here today. We experienced that long, long <laughs> process <laughs> of bringing some dusty old classic to new life. Mm -hmm. Current, relevant, full of objects and specific details and doings. What would you be doing if you didn't come here to play the scene? That's what he would say. His scenes were always teeming with life and creativity. I tell you, some of those improvisations in Walt's rehearsals were like the most creative and exhilarating experiences of my creative life. Walt was not always easy as a teacher. He was demanding and exacting, and he didn't let you get away with anything false. You know, you'd pull up those chairs after the scene, the hot seats, and he'd say, okay, what are you working on? And you'd tell him, and, and as often as not, he'd say, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the pencils would start flying. He didn't like your answer, there went the pencil. He worked step by step in a most organized way. 
to first help you be yourself, living truly on stage long before you got some fancy character to play. He genuinely parsed out his praise, saying, very good. <laughs> I will never forget the revelation of seeing students miraculously transformed while describing a pencil <laughs> and his under his gentle and sometimes hard to hear promptings. You know, we'd all be craning our ears, like, what did he say? I have never seen so many girls artfully clean out their purses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I didn't know that I was in for when I first signed up to be a Wickoverian, <laughs> whatever we're called now, was that he would impact so profoundly on my whole life. We became friends. There were the parties that Walt and his beautiful partner Dick Hughes threw at 12th Street and then later at the loft. Oh my gosh, I can't see. Full of attractive and talented people, music and great food, cute guys that Walt and I both like the same guy. <laughs> you know who <laughs> Um, my, I met my husband uh, in a Walt production, so therefore my two children were born because of him. And I think Susan and Leonard could say the same thing. They met through Walt. Uh, and he took such an interest in the kids all through the years of their growing up. Uh, after he heard um, Natasha play the piano when she was a teenager getting ready for college, he was so moved because he truly loved piano playing, he loved classical music. And he called me up and said, Lenore, I want to give Natasha a piano. And to have her choose which, which of those two back-to-back -back pianos in the loft she wanted. And I felt like that was instrumental, no pun intended, <laughs> and her getting a piano scholarship was very helpful to me and to her as well. Walt was generous to all of us, and he was utterly seductive. <laughs> he could get you to do his bidding like nobody's business. <laughs> a few of the tasks I performed for him, I was one of Mrs. Benton's readers. Are there any more of Mrs. Benton's readers here? Yes, they're all over the place. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> um, I helped him with auditions. Anybody ever help Walt with auditions? I there. I worked the door at his parties. Did anybody work the door? Of course. Did anybody work the lights? I did best postcards for his events. I edited his writing. Anybody else edit his writing? Oh yes. I sang at his benefits, served on planning committees, the list goes on and on. But always, always, he was there for me. He understood my troubles. He gave me scholarships guised as being the class librarian <laughs> or key student when I was broke. He was the best theater companion. We saw many shows together, and there was nobody better to trash bad productions or to analyze <laughs> good ones. <laughs> he didn't mess words. <laughs> he loved all things of high art, classical music opera, poetry, the classics of theater and literature, and he knew everything. If you had a question, you just called Walt. He was like a walking encyclopedia. He was one of the most well-read people I've ever known, with an impish wit and razor-sharp intelligence. For me, Walt's humanity and empathy, his pain born of his own struggles, his understanding of the delicacy of the creative process, along with his talent, craft, and skill, made him simply the best teacher I've ever known. I learned to teach by being taught by him and watching him teach others. Um, that he actually asked me to teach for him at his studio was a supreme vote of confidence. And I'll always be grateful for that. I love you, Walt. And I thank you so much for sharing your love of theater, acting, and actors with me, for giving me craft and helping me find a unique artist in myself, as you did for everyone who was fortunate to have been your student. 
We had many a good laugh and cry, many great classes, many great meals and parties. It was a grand, long run, and I'm so glad I stuck around. <laughs> Always be with me, always be with all of us. Sorry, but Walt isn't 
there to see what they're doing for them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I and myself were a, a com, kind of like compadres with Paul. We came up at about the same time. He went to Cornell, I went to Syracuse University, I studied with my teacher. And somewhere in that period of time, uh, in that period down at the Cherry Lane Theater, one day I walked in and, and for the first time in my life I saw an actor on stage who stayed with me, who I never knew before. And it was a man named Walt Whitcomb. He had come from Cornell University, and there was something about his presence that turned me here, uh, melted me, call it what you will. And years later, uh, it was my, my luck caught that, and Anne's luck to suddenly have a connection with Walt Whitcomb. He decided to put us together in a play that uh, off Broadway, way off Broadway. He was living, he was living off Broadway too. <laughs> he lived on Mulberry Street. He had got in the neighborhood right on top of all the coffee places and the restaurants and everything else. And he was part of that whole period. He lived there. He was part of his life. And uh, one day he said, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to do something with you and Anne, you know, some, some mission guys would have done. He had no idea what he was talking about. Because <laughs> he didn't talk in, you know, subtly or with, with, with focus. It, it kind of came out as a, like, 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 a, like a, 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 a storm or, a, a, or, a, or, a, or Something that it suddenly all of a sudden you knew what he was talking about, but you had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to do something to do it in hand. I do it in that old And it was some plays that he wanted to do. I says, What plays? He said, By Corner Lane. Who's Corner Lane? <laughs> this is a French playwright. He's very, very well known. I says, I'll, I'll do that, sure. What else? <laughs> Anything you want to do. And uh, it's up to you to now put it together. <laughs> so what he did was somehow he, he managed to put us on stage together. And uh, Anne was an actress who was walking around New York looking for work, and I doing uh, about the same thing. And uh, he suddenly said, "Well, let's do something together." And it's some some place that would be maybe memorable sometime in your life. I said, "What's that all?" About? <laughs> Sounds like a disaster before. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, it's, it's something by Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Coeur d'Alene is somebody I did not know. But whatever it was, he, he put it on, its, on my feet. He put me on my feet. He put Anna together with us. And suddenly, a, a, a two-son was discovered. Nobody knew who the heck we were anyway at that time. And suddenly, we were discovered by Walter putting us in a play by Court <laughs> And uh, at that point, it suddenly occurred to me that Walter was creating something between Anne and myself that never existed. <laughs> we were married, we had lived together, we had uh, screwed around together, and all those things. <laughs> <laughs> we had never acted together. <laughs> so all of a sudden, he put us up there in front of people, and there was a connection with us that we had no idea could ever happen. When do husbands and wives even talk to each other? Three times three was called. And it, uh, were, were pieces from Shakespeare, from uh, uh, ancient pieces that were never done before. <laughs> and uh, they stayed that way. <laughs> He didn't say it in any specific way, he had to figure it out. And so, somehow, and this is the way I can describe it now, one day we got a call from an agent who said, uh, there's a show called The Ed Sullivan Show, and they need an act, and they need, uh, would you two like to go on The Ed Sullivan Show? I said, well, well, we don't know from Ed Sullivan, except when we watch him. He said, what can you do? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So I said, 
Walt Whitcomb. Walt Whitcomb, maybe he can come up with something. What did he know about that song? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, I called up Walt, and he put together a piece where Anne and I met in an improvisational situation. And the first line that he said, say, said, say this line. I would say, what's the line? He says, how do you do? <laughs> 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 I said, how do you do? She said, how do you do? I said, I'm made up the name. I'm Rishi Horowitz. She said, Horowitz? Yes, Horowitz. H-R-O-W-I-T-Z. Hershey. My friends call me Hesh. She said, I'm Mary Elizabeth Doyle. My friends call me Mary Elizabeth. <laughs> I says, what do you do? She says, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I says, uh, would you like to go out for dinner or something? Sure. Well, why don't you come over to my mother's house? I said, it's Friday night, she makes great kasha bonnet. She says, <laughs> she says, what's that? I says, it's, it's some, some stuff, the Jewish stuff, whatever you want. So she came to my mother's house. My mother couldn't cook. <laughs> so they ordered in something from Chinese. So, anyway, so Walter came, and suddenly he, he was there, uh -huh. and he became like a, a shidduch, that's the word in Yiddish, to bring people together. I don't know why, but he was such a wonderful actor. I'd seen him on the Cherimane Theater doing things, and at that time nobody knew from him. There were people like Gene Sachs and Harry Belafonte, who was coming out of the new school. All these people were strange people. And Walter was one of these actors who, when he went on stage at this Cherry Lane Theater one night, I could not forget him. He was so entrancing. The words came out in, not, not like, like words from his play, but out of his soul. And then when it was over, sometime later, I had an opportunity to talk to him. And he said, uh, I'd like to do something with you. I said, well, what, like what? He says, well, you and that, uh, that Ann Mirror, who is she? Mm -hmm. I said, she's going to be my wife, I think. Well, she is my wife, but sleeping. <laughs> 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 so, so, okay, let's, let's go to my studio. Now, the studio was on Mulberry Street, Little Italy. Uh, you can smell the, the, the pizzas coming up through mm -hmm. the fence. And uh, we went up uh, to this apartment, which was... Uh, his, his, his really his place, his, his home. And we sat down and he started to chat with us. And then the next thing, we were doing an improvisation. And the first lines out of my mouth were to this girl, Anne Mira, who was hardly known to me, was, how do you do? And she said, how do you do? And I said, I'm Hershey Horowitz. <laughs> she said, Horowitz? I said, Horowitz. H O R O W I T. Jerry. Well, shut up. Here to show you this picture. That's why I'm behind you. This is my assistant. <laughs> Jody, can you say from what picture are we talking about? The one that Walter took of you and Andy. Oh, thank you, Jody. Thank you, Jody. Thank you very much, Jody. Uh, we'll pass it around. <laughs> this is a, a wedding picture. And put that, that's why this picture is so precious. And why should we brought it up? Uh, we had no wedding. <laughs> but it was uh, something we did at City Hall. But uh, somehow or other, Walter had the gedult, or the, the, the chutzpah, to take a picture of these two characters who had no semblance in life. And uh, it became our wedding picture. Thanks, Judy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, from that point on, in everything I ever did, it was Walt Whitcomb's words, his advice, and his teachings that stayed with me forever. And there was one line that stayed with me and made, made me into an actor, really. Because I, at that time, I was just a guy who, who, who spouted stuff out of my mouth whenever it came up. And he said, take it from the other person. What was that all about? Well, it was it. 
Everybody here in this audience, if you want to be on the stage, the one thing you should know when you're on that stage and when you have to start acting, <laughs> before you do anything else, take it from the other person. Look in their eyes. See what those eyes are selling you. And then do what you have to do. And that has stayed with me from that day to the very day where we are tonight. Anyway, I just want to say I'm so happy to be here with all of us to honor the wonderful actor, the wonderful creator, the wonderful director, and my greatest friend, Walter Whitco. Thank you. 